Now, chapter 21 in this, in this book of John almost seems like an addendum, like it was just added after things were, had been concluded. Because this story in John chapter 21 begins with the words, after these things. You know, a lot of things happen after these things. If you go back to chapter 20, there is Thomas doubting that Jesus was raised from the dead as the disciples huddled in that locked room. After these things, Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. I'm not sure what the disciples were thinking or seeing in this story. They seemed to be out there by themselves. After all, they saw Jesus at least twice in the room that was locked. And still here in this story, they have no idea who it is on shore? I don't know. After these things, it just seems like the disciples just went back to their normal life. Okay, Messiah here, Messiah crucified, Messiah risen. Let's go back to fishing. It just doesn't seem right, does it? They go back to the beach. They plan a fishing trip. They get big Z's fishing. Outcast right there, Ileana down there off of Isles of Capri, and they go out there. Well, maybe they don't pay, but they go out there fishing anyways with bottom. These things are the kind of things that have happened after these things. Now, we all want to go back to normal after these things. Go back to work after a friend or relative dies. Going back to a normal routine, a predictable routine, whatever that might be. After an accident, a bankruptcy, a disaster, whatever it might be, we want to go back to normal. Like the disciples want to go back to normal, the, the things they, familiar, they were familiar with. You know, they had just finished meeting Jesus twice in a locked room. You know, you've seen in chapter 20, it's kind of a long chapter that's there. They're holed up in a locked room. They're afraid. They're worried. They're scared. He shows up, peace be with you. They see this, not just an apparition, but the risen Christ among them with the nail prints in his hand, the side that's pierced, and Thomas isn't there. Thomas says, I want to see this guy. I don't believe. Comes back a second time. Thomas is there, and he believes. And at the end of chapter 20, there's a couple of verses that talk about the purpose of this book. And the writer says, so that, so that you may believe and have life in his name, in verse 31. You know, there's a, you'd think it's the end. But chapter 21, I think, tries to tie up some loose ends that just aren't concluded in the story of Jesus. There's so much more to this story than Jesus just hosting a, a morning beachside fish fry along the waters. These are, these are, there are details reminiscent of uh, denial that Peter did. Reminders of regrets. Responses that lead to redemption. It's there, and there's more in this final chapter of John's account of Jesus' life. You know these meals. You know, so much happens in life over meals. Now, when I was in my early 30s, my mom would take me out to lunch. We'd go to a place in Mannheim, Pennsylvania called the Cat's Meow, best chicken wings ever. And uh, we'd get a little corner table, we'd order our food, and then mom would look me straight in the eye. And only like a mother can, she would say, Edward, which I hated. Edward, which is not a good thing. Edward, are you happy? And the conversation would take off from there. No meals. Breaking bread. Sharing a table. Looking at a person eye to eye across that table provides a scenario that could easily lead to a last supper, a last breakfast, a last encounter, or a deeper understanding of the person you're with. Now, when thinking about last meals, I, I tried to recall the last time I shared a meal with my dad before he died. And the only one to remember is that my is that when my son Zachary got married, we went to the reception and Jane and I shared the table with mom and dad. That was probably the last meal we had. It was a joyous time, a time of celebration. You know, you think about the book of John, it has this symmetry to it. Think of a, a pendulum on a grandfather's clock that goes back and forth. And that, that happens throughout the book of John the entire time. All the stories, they go from darkness to light. Think of Nicodemus meeting Jesus in chapter 3. 
the darkness and the dark of night, but then to the light of day. It goes from death to life, from no food to 12 baskets full, to a night of not catching fish, to abundance in the morning. It's this pendulum that goes back and forth in the book of John. And in this final chapter, it moves from this dinner, the defamation, the denial of Jesus following dinner, to redemption and salvation at sunrise. You know, when you think about Peter, he, he fumbled the ball. He denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed. And not only did he deny Jesus, but Peter did it while warming himself by a charcoal fire in the courtyard of the high priest. And John remembers that denial. And just imagine Peter showing up at the beach with Jesus at the charcoal fire. The same charcoal fire that where he denied his Lord. That's the background. That's, that's the swing of the pendulum. And after all the deception, after seeing Jesus behind locked doors, after witnessing the, the rising of the dead, this merry band of disciples, you know what they want to do? They just want to go and fish. Doesn't that sound kind of odd to you? Maybe it's not odd. Maybe it's us wanting to go back to a sense of routine, a sense of normalcy, a sense of predictability. They go back to a life that they know and they understand how old we was, as long as I keep busy, I'm fine, right? But maybe we keep too busy. And we don't grapple with the new life that God delivers to us every single day. Most of us appreciate that keeping busy approach to life. During a visit to a mental asylum, a visitor asked the director, how do you determine whether or not a patient should be institutionalized? Well, said the director, we fill up a bathtub. Then we offer a teaspoon, a teacup, and a bucket to the patient and ask him or her to empty the bathtub. Oh, I understand, said the visitor. A normal person would use the bucket because it's bigger than the spoon or the teacup. No, said the director. A normal person would pull the plug. Do you want a window room? <laughs> no, Peter wasn't a normal person. He hadn't been normal since the day Jesus entered his life. That didn't mean he was going to get a bed by the window in a mental institution. What it meant for Peter is that God had big plans for him as God has big plans for each of us. But in order to fulfill those plans, Peter had to let go of some things. One of which was that heart-rending heavy burden of his denial. Imagine him denying Jesus three times. It had to weigh on him. It had to be part of his psyche, part of what he thought about. Like maybe each of us think about things we say or do that makes an impact that we just wish we could take back, but we can't. And John, in this story, at the very beginning, after these things, John tells us how Jesus plans to show himself in this way, as John said. They're on the beach, five disciples and two others, it's a very simple story. Simon Peter says, I'm going fishing. We'll go with you. I mean, how? It's not an involved dialogue taking place. They climb into the boat. After all that has happened, they push off into the Sea of Tiberias in the cover of darkness. It's night, and they move across the chaotic waters of evening, much like their chaotic night following the arrest of Jesus. And they catch nothing. Nothing. As we do when we try to go back to a normal routine. After something miraculous happens. After something amazing happens. After something tumultuous happens. And after a long night. And just after daybreak. <laughs> it's Jesus standing on the beach. And they don't recognize him. After meeting him twice, they still don't know who this guy is. And like most visitors to a beachside fishing resort, or when the Naples Pier was still standing, what do most of us say when we, when we see someone with the fishing, with the line in the water, what do we say? What do we ask? 
Did you catch anything? Jesus is no different. Did you catch anything? Looks like you guys have nothing. How's it going? Did you try casting the net on the other side? It had come up empty. Our lives come up empty. If after having experienced Jesus, we just go back to normal living, routine life. Without Jesus, we don't catch anything. Or if we do, it's just temporary. Dick Prince told me in sermon using, they don't call it catching, they call it fishing. You don't catch anything, you fish. It's not just a question. Jesus then tells them how to fish. Cast it on the starboard side, on the right side. They follow the stranger's direction. Abundance abounds. And still unaware of Jesus' identity, the disciple whom Jesus loved, they, <coughs> excuse me, guys, it's, by the way, the disciple whom Jesus loved is never named in the book of John. He reclines with Jesus at the Last Supper, always the disciple whom Jesus loved, never named. You know, when, when he says, it's the Messiah, it's Jesus, it's like saying, He's back. It's Messiah guys showing up again. And Peter puts on some clothing, jumps into the sea. No walking on water this time. Jesus disrupts the routine. Peter arrives on the beach. The scene had to be painful for there. Jesus is frying fish on the charcoal fire. The same charcoal fire where Peter warmed his hands in the courtyard of the high priest denied Jesus. What do you think he thought of when he saw that? And the disciples who finally make their way ashore, they received a haul of fish. Somebody, I don't know who, counted 153 fish. Who counts that many fish? Now don't interrupt me. One, two, three. Are we eating at four o'clock? Oh, no, I got one, two, and it starts over again. There's, there's always room in God's house for another fish, another person, another soul that needs to be caught, another soul that needs to be saved in the chaotic and dangerous waters that churn in the world in which we live. And Jesus, after seeing his disciples in the midst of their earthly routine, after being crucified and resurrected, he feeds them fish and bread. John says this is the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, each of us come back to life in one form or another after the loss of a person we love, after a divorce, after, after losing a job, after finding a new place to live, moving from the, well, now the warm, warm north to the warm, warm south, coming back from life harrowing surgery or relationships with family or friends in the rocks. And like the disciples, we want life to return to normal. But with Jesus, it's anything but normal. Our eyes cannot comprehend the miracle of being resurrected when the wheels of life come off the wagon. And Jesus simply feeds, feeds their soul. So there are three simple questions asked of Peter. Do you love me more than these. The Greek word that Jesus uses for love is agape, that Christ-like, all-forgiving, accepting love. And I'm guessing with these, he's referring to the disciples around him. But as Jesus asked the question with agape, Peter answered with the, the Greek word philos, you know, friendly kind of, brotherly kind of, Philadelphia kind of love, if you can be loved in Philadelphia, but in Philadelphia kind of love. Philos. With each answer, Jesus responds, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. This passage should be known as the last breakfast, because before Jesus exits stage up, Peter is told to feed, to tend, and to feed. This is a story of Peter's redemption, following the denial of Jesus of the night of his arrest. He is fed. He is redeemed. He is pointed into a new direction. 
The final verses in John 21 basically tell us how Peter will be, how his life will end. He'll be crucified as Jesus was. Jesus comes to him. Peter runs toward routine. That's what happens. Jesus comes to us and we run away towards routine, predictability, because the change is too tumultuous or too scary or too frightful. And yet in that change, we can become something brand new. Jesus prepares a meal in the presence of his one-time enemy. Jesus makes sure that as the good shepherd, Peter's cup overflows, knowing that surely goodness and mercy will follow him all the days of his life. Jesus lives out Psalm 23 in this story. He does not allow the evil one to